does it ever cause you to rethink about what you might say, you know, uh, positions you might take, given the intensity of the blowback sometimes? Well, yeah. Uh, I, during the 2020 election season, I had a formula, uh, which was, I'm going to vote for Biden, but you shouldn't believe me because if I were going to vote for Trump, I would never tell you. <laughs> so if you ask me who I'm going to vote for, there's no information in my response. You ask me who I'm going to vote for, I'm going to vote for Biden. Mm. But you should have no change of your prior estimate who I'm voting for from mm -hmm. the fact that I said that because there's really only one answer to that question. Mm -hmm. So where does Glenn stand on Trump? Because one of my points that I've been uh, making over and over again in conversation with John McWhorter, who very forthrightly as a good New Yorker denounces Trump at every opportunity. He's a moron. He's an idiot. He's whatever. Is that, hey, man, you know, like 45% of the population think the guy's, a, you know, they think he should be president. I mean, maybe we ought to think about why they think that. Maybe we shouldn't reduce our reaction to Trump down to a, a personal evaluation of his character. And we should think a little bit more broadly about the structures of America. The tectonic plates is my metaphor that are shifting under our feet in American culture and in politics, of which the uh, ascendancy of Trump is one manifestation. And when we reduce our evaluation of this phenomenon to an assessment of his character, we're giving short shrift to the sentiments of those many, many millions who think that uh, he is representing them. He's their tribune, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's as far as I would allow myself to go into the, oh, you're a Trump apologist right. world. Now, many people, uh, some of them dear friends of mine, some of them I actually live with, <laughs> <laughs> are saying, why are you not more vociferously denouncing this monstrous, in, you know, imposition on American democracy? Um, and I'm, in, I'm being invited, excuse me, mm -hmm. to perform. I mean, I've been, you got a platform, people follow you, people respect you, they say, and they do. They, you know, Glenn, you're brilliant, Glenn, you should run for president. I get these kind of comments. Mm -hmm. You should be using your platform to denounce this gangster and thug and, you know, mm -hmm. moron and whatever. And I, I refuse to do it. But <laughs> uh, I do that cautiously. I mean, I, I, I am saying just as much as I dare say that's favorable to Trump. So, <laughs> uh, it, and I dare not say anything further, even if I think it. Mm -hmm. so, you know, because that would be... You know, maybe that would be the kiss of death. Maybe that would be, you know, that would. I, so I'm managing my brand, I, I must confess, by carefully selecting how it is that I react to uh, the Trump phenomenon so as to be able to maintain plausible deniability. Right. What gives you, well, I'll preface this with, you would get a lot of points if you did denounce Trump you know, in the circles that people like you and me sort of find ourselves in, you know, the elite institutional circles yeah. and media, in the media, there's a lot of anti-Trump sentiment to put it mildly. Yeah. And so you would get points for denouncing him. Um, it's a much, it's a hard position to take even to sort of go for neutrality. What gives you the courage to not to, to stand up for the sort of the more neutral position, to stand up for the position where you don't sort of reflexively denounce Trump? I can't answer that. I don't know. I appreciate that you think I'm courageous. Thank you. Where that uh, character trait of mine comes from, I'm not sure I can say. Uh, I can report to you that I hate to be bullied. Uh, you know, don't tell me what to think and don't tell me what to say, you know. Uh, so you want to call me a name, call me a name. But uh, if you want to change my mind, you had better make an argument. It had better be a good one, this kind of thing. So I don't like crowds. I don't like herds. Uh, I don't like to see, I don't like to wave banners. Uh, I don't uh, care that much for virtue signaling um, as a practice. Um, 
and you know i've i've uh yeah i was a black reaganite conservative in the 1980s mm-hmm. okay so you know not a hugely I, unpopular I, position yeah that was very unpopular in a lot of quarters i got denounced by my own children you know uh what, for, did, that, what did that feel like it felt really really terrible actually because i said look let, i can you know uh respect me enough to give me the latitude to think for myself and we don't have to agree but that doesn't make me a bad person um and maybe you ought to stop and listen there might be a certain amount of wisdom uh here after all these decades of life i have reasons for taking the positions that i do I mean, maybe you ought to sit back and think about don't be so arrogant don't think you know everything you're not that smart kind of thing like that but of course i wouldn't say it like that uh but 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 it's all you know it's all good we we're we're happily uh, ensconced as, uh, you know, I have five children, six grandchildren, and, you know, we get together with the, uh, their spouses and whatnot every year on the Outer Banks, North Carolina, for a week of uh, bonding and all of that, and, uh, you know, it's all good. Is that, a, is that a theme? Like, that That seems to commonly come up now in the sort of social media climate that I spend a lot of my time trying to trying to escape but failing to escape. The idea that because you hold a politically different position, you must be somehow bad or, or, you know, morally wrong. Like it's 45% of America would vote for Donald Trump to be the president. Right. And a lot of the response to that from uh, the quarters where, like I spend a lot of my time, is that those 45% must be bad in some way. Same was happening to you with the discussions with your children about supporting Reagan. By the yeah, sounds of way back. Yeah. yeah. Is that, is that just, it's just that effect of life? Is it, is, it, is it changing in any way? Well, I think it's changing. Again, I don't um, have a chapter and verse on that. I'm, I'm not no, an academic studying that in a systematic way. Uh, but, I, but I think we have become much more in, uh, siloed and, and much more uh, uh, kind of uh, divided into camps. Uh, who have a hard time talking uh, to one another. Uh, I, I was just reading Matt Taibbi's book, Hate, Inc., and I was very impressed by it. Uh, so far, I haven't, I haven't quite finished, but I'm about halfway through. First and, serialized on Substack and then turned yeah, into a paperback. I, I, I have the paperback now. I didn't see it when, uh, when he was putting these posts up, but uh, he has an analysis there about the interaction between media and uh, political uh, aspirants. Uh, and how things get framed and and uh, whatnot, and I think that the social media evolution factors into that because it becomes very uh, easy to uh, the algorithms, I suppose, of recommended things help you know to to just go to the sites and read the stuff that you want to read and talk to the people that you want to talk to who agree with you, and you know then demonization of the other side follows uh, pretty naturally, and uh, you know nuance yeah, suffers as a result well it must be it's very difficult to do the opposite you've shown you know you are your, your own kids sort of were denouncing you or disagreeing with you at, at least and it's it's hard to take the independent position it seems like yeah i guess that's right um i guess that's right i've tried to have people on the show uh who challenge me and my wife lawan my lovely wife has uh, <laughs> encouraged me in this regard had Cornell West on the show, and, and we had a wonderful conversation. Mm-hmm. I've had Brianna Joy Gray on the show. Mm-hmm. I've had Richard Wolf, the Marxist economist, on the show. These are people that come at the issues that I'm concerned about rather differently than I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm proud to be able to say that I can have you know cordial and productive conversations with them, and you know I intend to do more of that. So, given your experience uh, with. Uh, political discourse over the decades and given what you see happening now with social media um, and perhaps other aspects of um, publishing sort of intensifying tribalism uh, and given what you're experiencing when you have these kind of across the aisle conversations on the Glenn show what are you optimistic or pessimistic somewhere in between when it comes to um, how discourse is going how we might evolve as a culture yeah, it's a big question. 
maybe I'm going to say pessimistic uh, because we are so polarized. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, to the point where large numbers of people question the outcome of elections. Uh, and uh, that can go in both directions, by the way. I mean, Trump lost the most recent election for president, and he's a election denier and his followers to the extent that they don't acknowledge the legitimacy of Biden's election. But believe me, that's not over. There will be other elections. There will be different outcomes. And it's like the cat is out of the bag now on this. It becomes okay to, you know, um, uh, deny the legitimacy of the only process that we have for actually adjudicating these political disputes. So uh, if you can't settle it in, within an institutional framework where everybody kind of accepts the rules and when they win, great, and when they lose, well, too bad, but we'll, we'll carry on. If you can't do that, well, what's left? Uh, you know, gangs of uh, thugs in the street banging away at each other, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Or as uh, Matt Taibbi says, uh, you know, the person who disagrees with you has to be Hitler. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing short of Hitler. So and then if they're Hitler, well... Anything you can do to defeat Hitler is uh, is legitimate, and that's worrying. That's very worrying. On the other hand, it is possible to to have a conversation with just about anybody instantly and to send it out to millions of people, and that's really pretty cool. Um, so the I don't blame the medium for the fact that it can abet partisan polarization and uh, division uh, because it can also facilitate um, a, uh, a different kind of discourse. And, you know, there are, there are actors here. Uh, Taibbi focuses on the commercial interests of, uh, of the um, media. Uh, political parties are also organizing, raising large amounts of money, using social media to raise the money to fund their uh, candidates and their campaigns. And they have an interest in, you know, the negative campaigning is the way to go now. So many people are doing it. And I assume negative campaigning is uh, uh, easier to do when you can put a uh, message in everybody's email inbox to tell them about how horrible the world is coming to an end. The world will end tomorrow if you don't give me $14. Fourteen dollars standing between uh, you and the end of democracy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the same kind of thing coming from the other side. I mean, it, you know, both sides are are doing it.